be with us. Blessing us today. Keeping your hand upon us. In Jesus' name. it to the Lord in prayer. I was having a conversation this weekend with my daughter's boyfriend and he doesn't know God and we're hoping that one day he will and we were talking to him just about prayer. Now prayer doesn't mean that you're never going to have trials. Prayer doesn't go into God from prayer doesn't mean that you're never going to have problems. But going to God in prayer means He's going to be there with you through it all. And He's going to help you through those trials, through those problems, through those temptations, through whatever comes your way, it enables God to be there to help you through it. So go to God in prayer. Believe in prayer. I am a firm believer in the power of prayer. If we can turn on our Bibles this morning to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. Gone a little different way this morning. I'm hoping that this word this morning will help you as you live for God. As we go about our daily lives, wanting to keep God close to us all along the way. Amen. Hebrews 4. We're going to begin reading there at verse number 1. It says, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us, entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word, was, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. As he said, as I, have I, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest for, to the people of God, for he that has entered into his rest he also, also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. I want to turn your attention back to verse number 11. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for all that are assembled here together this morning. We ask God that you would help us to hear your voice, to feel your presence today, Jesus. I ask God that your word would be imprinted upon our hearts as we have a desire to follow you and give our lives to you that we may, may walk in your presence all the days of our lives. God, I give you all praise, all glory and honor this morning in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I want to speak to you this morning on what I have titled, Working Closer to God. Working Closer to God. 
Many of us have at some time or may still currently be working in a secular job where you need to get up every morning and go to a place of employment. Why do we do this? Why do we desire to get up early in the morning to go and work? One simple reason, a paycheck. That's why the majority of us get up every morning and we make our way to a job because we want that paycheck every two weeks or a couple times a month because we need to live. We need food, shelter, clothing. We need all the things that are going to sustain us to be able to live in this world in which we find ourselves. If you've ever paid attention to bumper stickers, you've likely seen the bumper sticker that says, I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. A vast portion of the workforce, that is the best reason that they can muster for going to their job every day. Because I owe money. I need that paycheck. That's why I go to work. According to one poll, only 43% of American office workers are satisfied with their jobs. In Japan, that figure dips to 17%. In the first century, Christian slaves had even less reason to be enthusiastic about their work. They were forced. They weren't going for a paycheck. But Paul gave them a way to grasp a glimpse of glory amid their daily grind. He wanted them to adorn the doctrine of God, which is to show the beauty of their faith in Christ by how they work. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. He was talking to a people that weren't just going to a job to earn a, their, a paycheck. They were forced into a, in a place that they didn't want to be. But no matter where we find ourselves, when we're working, we need to put God still first in our lives. We need to, no matter what situation we come across, no matter what thing happens in our daily life, we need to say, God, I want to give you glory. I want to be able to show the world who you are by how I work, by what I do, by the actions that I have in my life. You see, a very significant and often overlooked way that we serve God is in our everyday life tasks. Martin Luther understood this when he wrote, the maid who sweeps the kitchen is doing the will of God just as much as the monk who prays. Not just because she might sing a Christian hymn as she sweeps, but because God loves clean floors. The Christian shoemaker does his Christian duty not by putting little crosses on shoes, but by making good shoes. Because God he can show forth God in the work that he does through his craftsmanship. I read a little story as I was putting this together. and It talked about a man many years ago when they actually made shoes by hand. And he said he went to work for a cobbler and, and the cobbler was a Christian man. And he says and the, this man would, have, would build his shoes. And he said that on the heel of the shoe there was a little piece of leather that would be nailed onto the heel of that shoe. And the cobbler gave this young man this, the, uh, the job of pounding out the, the leather that go on that heel. So he would have to soak the leather in, in water and, and make sure that the water was well absorbed into that leather. And then he had to sit there for hours on end pounding on that leather, beating on it and beating on it and beating on it until it was dry. Then at which time he would nail that leather onto the heel of the shoe and and this young man didn't understand why they had to do this. And, and he was looking at a cobbler up the road who was not a Christian man. And the other cobbler seemed to be always very busy. And all these young people would always be coming into his shop. And, and he would treat them and help them out and do things with them. And he realized, he went into the shop one day and he was watching this other cobbler as he was doing his shoes. And he watched as he just took the wet leather 
cut it out, and nailed it onto the bottom of the shoe. He thought, why am I spending hour after hour after hour pounding the water out of this leather on these shoes, and this cobbler up the street is just doing it, just putting on the wet leather? That would save so much time. So he went back to work at his job, and he mentions that to his boss and says, this guy up the road, he's saving a lot of time. He's making more money on his shoes. And the Christian cobbler turned to this young man and said, his shoes are going to come back. Because by pounding out the, by soaking that leather in the water and by pounding that moisture out of that leather, you're making that leather hard. He says, well, I'm going to sell a pair of shoes. They're not coming back. Not for a long time. And God wants me to build shoes that are going to last, not build shoes to make money. And we can show forth the things, the, the glory and the grace of God in our lives by our everyday tasks. By when we go to work every single day, how do we apply ourselves in our jobs? What are we doing that we can decide in our lives to give God glory? Because God is very much interested in the lives that we live. He's interested in us giving glory to Him through our work. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. You see, in this life, our attitude is what's going to make all the difference. As a Christian and as just as an individual, the attitude that we have in our daily tasks is going to make all the difference in what people see in us. We need to change how we look at everything we do. It doesn't matter if you're the CEO of a company with a beautiful corner office overlooking a city, or if you're the janitor of that building, sweeping floors and cleaning toilets. If you are a Christian, if you want to have God in your life, if you want to be able to show forth God in your life, doesn't matter the job that you have, you can still glorify Him by how you do your job. By the attitude that you have when you go to work every single day. See, when you work, and you work to the best of your ability, utilizing the talents that God has given you, you will glorify Him. Every day isn't going to be your best. There's lots of times I've gone to work and I've been tired. And I've gone to work and I've been grumpy. And I've gone to work and I just haven't really felt like being there. And you don't apply yourself as much. And you don't work as hard as you should. And you make it through the day. But I'll tell you one thing that when you if you live that lifestyle, it may not bother you. But if you live the lifestyle saying that I want to go to work every day, I want to do my best in my work every day, and I want to be able to put in all the effort that I can every day, you're going to feel different even when you get home. Because on those days when I've gone, gone to work and I haven't really applied myself and I haven't really got a lot accomplished, I go home and I actually feel miserable. Because I feel like I've done nothing. And then there are those days I go to work and it's super busy and I'm Sometimes it's even stressful, but I look back through my day and I think, I got a lot done today. I managed to accomplish so many things and I go home and I feel good. And that's what God wants us to do. He wants us to apply ourselves. He wants us to be able to look at Him as being a part of our job when we go to work every day, when we go about our daily tasks every day. Wednesday night we, we had a Bible study and was talking about murmuring and complaining and I voiced that last week, I didn't have a very good week. I don't know whether I was under a spiritual attack or some kind of attack, whether or whether it was just a bad week. But right from the beginning of Monday, people were coming into my office and I was irritable. And I was trying so hard through my day to just get people out of my office before I said something that I didn't want to say and shouldn't be saying. And it just, it seemed to go on most of the week, and that's the way it was, and I was just going on like that. And I mentioned that in our Wednesday night Bible study, and Sister Zotsman made the comment, people are still looking at you. Maybe you're being 
maybe it's a test, maybe there's something going on so that I could show forth God to those people. When they see me in a situation like that, how am I going to respond? How am I going to act? Am I going to blow up and be the person that I shouldn't be? Or am I going to hold my tongue? Am I going to try to be my best to be patient and to be kind even in the midst of a trial and show forth God's glory? And show forth mercy to those people. They don't know what I'm going through. They don't understand the battle that's going on inside of my mind and inside of me. And they're just coming to my office for some help. And I need to not rip off their head and scream and holler at them like I felt like doing it in instances. But we can give God glory through the way that we act, through the way that we treat people in our everyday life. Did you know that when you're working, and I don't mean just in, when we're working for God, we're working every day. Doesn't have to be pulpit ministry. Doesn't have to be outreach. Doesn't have to be in, your, in witnessing to people out on the street. But working for God can be working. When you go to your daily job, you can still be working for God. When you go and help somebody move some furniture or do something at their home, you can still be working for God. And that's the attitude that we need to have and realize is that no matter where we go, we're working for God. No matter what we're doing, we're working for God. I might go to my job every day to collect a paycheck, but I'm still working for God. I still need to be the employee that is going to be pleasing to God in all that I do. But it's a mindset change. I listen to people all the time at my job complaining about the place that we work. And I think if you're that unhappy, go find another job. If, this, if your job is making you miserable, go find something else to do. There's that saying that says if you find work that you enjoy, do, or if you find a job that you enjoy doing, you'll never work a day in your life. Because it doesn't feel like work. But sometimes we need God's help in that. Sometimes we need to trust in God. And that's why it's important every morning when you get up. It's not asking for the blessings upon your life. But when you get up in the morning, say, God, help me to be a light today. Help me to be a beacon to the lost that I work with every day. When I go to work, when those situations arise that are going to test me and are going to be that trial to me today, I need you, God, to be in it with me. I need you to help me to be able to glorify you. That when people are, the Bible says that when Jesus reviled, he reviled not again. People are going to come at us about different things. We need to be calm, we need to be patient, and we need to show forth God to those around you. Because when you have that mindset, whatever you do, you're going to say, God, I want to give you glory in it. Like a craftsman building something. I want to build it to the best of my abilities. Because I don't want it to fail. I've seen lots of things that people have built that they just throw together. Mass, produced, mass production. And then I see somebody like Brother Beer, who is a craftsman who can build beautiful things that are going to last. We go about our job and we put, a, put some, and I know that the Bible says that pride goeth before the, the storm. I don't mean pride in being proud in that sense, but taking pride in what we do. Whether it's cleaning a toilet, I'm going to make sure that that toilet is sparkling. I'm going to make sure that it is clean when I'm done because somebody's going to come in and I don't want them thinking, oh, who cleaned this because they didn't do a good job. Oh, are you, God's going to get glory out of that? Yes, God can get glory out of that. Because they're going to look at you, see your works, and then glorify God who's in heaven. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning at verse number 1, says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Everywhere you go, 
people are watching you. When you live for God and people are watching you and they know that, you're say, that you live for God, you're scrutinized even more. The problem with mankind, with a lot of humanity, is most humanity doesn't want to see somebody else succeed. So whether you're living for God or not, when you're succeeding, others are watching for you to fail. When you're living for God, and, and people know, people may not know anything about God, but they've already got ideas formed on how we should live. And most of the time, they're right on how we should be living. I worked with a man who um, went to a different kind of church, and they were doing a lottery pool at work. And he was all upset. How come you guys didn't ask me to be a part of that pool? They said, well, we thought you went to church and that you wouldn't want to be interested in that. Well, no, I, I want to be a part of it. Conversations went around different times and, oh, what did you do on the weekend? Oh, yeah, I was over there and I was making my wine. I thought you went to church and you're making wine? Non-Christians know how we should and should not be living. And sometimes we muddle the waters by what we do, by what we allow in our lives. Because there is scrutiny upon us. People do know how we should live and how we shouldn't live. They know how we should treat people and how we shouldn't treat people. And they're watching us all the time, waiting for us to fail. Waiting for us to make those mistakes. See, when you have that mindset that no matter what you're doing, you're going to do it to glorify God, it's going to draw you closer to Him. Because your mind has changed. Your mindset is saying, I want God to be a part of what I'm doing. So therefore, you're going to invite him in to every avenue of your life. You're going to get up in the morning and say, God, I want you to go before me today. I want you to, to help me today. I want you to strengthen me today. And when you continuously do that, and you have that mindset saying, I, God, I want you to be a part of what it is that I'm doing, it's going to keep you closer to him. Then when those situations arise that are maybe going to test you a little bit and maybe want to cause you to say something you shouldn't say, you're going to think, no, I've asked God to be here with me today. I'm going to, God's going to help me through this today. And it's going to stop you from making those mistakes. And you can work yourself closer to God. Right. Do you know that there's a man in your Bible whose name is only mentioned three times? The three times were all in different books. And we're going to take a look at these three scriptures that mention this person. And we can infer something about this man based on what the Bible tells us and his walk with God through his life living for God. The man's name is Demas. He was mentioned in Colossians, 2 Timothy, and Philemon. So the, chrono chron the chronology of the epistles isn't certain, but everywhere that I looked, that all seems to be in agreement that Philemon was written earlier than Colossians and 2 Timothy quite a while after the two of them. So we can look at the way these are laid out. and We'll go through these three scriptures that outlines what people said about Demas' life. So if this chron chronology is correct, we begin with Philemon. So Philemon chapter 1, beginning at verse number 23, it's the passage that ends the book Philemon. Verse 23 says, There salute thee, Ephratus, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Arist Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. Verse 25 says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, with your spirit, sorry, amen. We look at verse number 24, it says, Marcus, Aristarchus, 
Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers. From this scripture we can infer that Demas was actively working for God. He was working together with Marcus, Aristarchus, Lucas, and Onesimus. To what capacity we're not told. All we know is the fact that when his name was mentioned in amongst the ranks of these other individuals, it says, my fellow laborer. means that he was working, doing work for God, that he was involved in the things of God. His heart, we can assume, was directed towards God and actively participating with those by his side. Now many times we come into, we come into the church, we, we come into a place where we decide we want to give our lives to God. And we begin to take service with God. When we experience the new birth experience and, and we've, we've repented of our sins, we've gone down into the wat watery grave of baptism and that old man dies, we rise up in newness of life, God fills us with the Holy Ghost. He puts a fire inside of us. And then inside of that fire that he puts inside of our hearts, we begin to have a desire and we begin to have a hunger to say, what can I do? Pastor, how can I help around the church? I want to be a part of the kingdom. I want, to, I want to be a part of this church. I want to be involved in the things that are going on. And there's different areas and avenues that you can be involved. When we're doing peanut brittle or when we're doing a, a work be around the church, when sometimes when we're painting and doing different things, anybody can be involved in that. Now, you don't just come into church and, and give your life to God and you don't get thrown behind a pulpit and you don't necessarily get thrown into a position of authority, but you can still work for God. You can still be a part of the church and a part of that kingdom and it makes you a part of the body when you're working for God. And you joyfully enter into service. And then when you go out about your daily life and you go back to work after all of this has happened, you go back with an intensity and a purpose because God changes something inside of you. And the job that you once had, maybe it's not a glory job, maybe it's not anything special, but you go to your work and you, go out and you, th and you begin to be believe that you can do better than what you were doing before. Because that fire inside is burning and it's burning bright and it affects all areas of your life as you give your all to God. And it should be manifested in every area of your life. And when you, get, when you come in and it's all fresh and it's all new, that's when you get up in the morning and you desire to have God walking with you. And you get up in the morning and you pray and say, God, help me to go about my day. Be with me today and give me strength and, and help me to be that light. Help me to be that beacon. Help me to do what you want me to do today, God. And you have that fire burning inside. But then time passes. Maybe you become lax in your prayers and maybe you become lax in your devotion to God and lax in the things of the kingdom. And after a little while that there's things going on at the church and I don't really, I don't want to take part in that. I don't, I don't want to go to that. I'm, I'm just too busy. It's, it doesn't really interest me anymore. And you go back to your job and it just becomes the same humdrum. Going for the paycheck again. And the fire starts to burn down. And the fire starts to go out. And suddenly the things of God are no longer as important. The next time that we hear Demas' name would be in Colossians. It's forward in your Bible, or back in your Bible, but it's, if we're going in chronological order, this is the one that comes next. Colossians chapter 4. Beginning at verse number 7. It says, All my state shall Tycheus to declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that he might know your estate and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus is... Marcus, sister's son to Barnabas, touching whom you received commandments, if he come unto you, receive him. And, ju and Jesus, which is called Justice, who were of the circumcision, these, are only my, these only are my fellow workers under the kingdom of God, which have been a comfort unto me. 
Epharus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluteth you always, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. For I bear him record that he hath a great zeal for you and them that are in Laodicea and in Hierapolis. Verse number 14 says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. I wanted to read that whole passage because he talks about Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, Tychius, who's a faithful minister and a fellow servant, Onesimus, who's a faithful and beloved brother. Goes on and he's using all of these terms for all of these men. And then he gets down to that last verse and he says, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. He went from a fellow servant, a fellow worker, one listed amongst the rest of them, to now he's Demas. He's still with the group. He's still trailing along with them. He's still following along. He's still going to church. He's still attending, still sitting on a pew. Starts missing maybe a few services here and there. Not really participating in what's going on around him, but just there in the background. Life is just going on for Demas at this point. Just like so many in our world today. Fervent in the beginning, on fire for God, wanting to do the things of God, wanting to reach the city, wanting to get out there. And then time goes along. And the fire burns low. Still in church, still attending, still singing the songs, still dressing the way I should dress, still looking like I belong amongst everybody else. But no longer having that desire to please God in all that you do. And your focus shifts once again from God-centered to self-centered. What am I doing? What's going to make me happy? And we listen to the world around us, and that's the way the world is completely focused now. What's going to make you happy? Do what you want. Live how you want. Act how you want. Be who you want. Doesn't matter how you were born. Just choose your own direction. Choose your own everything. When at the beginning we were on fire for God. At the beginning it was all about God. Wanting to please God. But now it's all about us. And God takes a back seat. The last time that we hear mention of Demas is in 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 10. It says, For Demas, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Demas has forsaken me. He's gone back to where he came from. Gone back to the life he was once living. He went from a fellow worker, fellow servant, one on fire for God, one that was part of the group, part of the one trying to reach the world, to one that was just tagging along, to one who walked away. No longer working, no longer striving to do what God wants. See, when enough time passes and the fire burns low, that work becomes less important. And your relationship with God also suffers. You see, again, our attitude is everything. We learned in our Wednesday night Bible study that murmuring and complaining is a sign of unbelief. We should be encouraging, uplifting, supporting. Because God is with you everywhere you go. You are a light everywhere you go. When you encounter somebody that is struggling, say, God, give me the words to speak to help this person. When, you, when you're at work, when you go to somebody else's work, everything that we do in life, we can work ourselves closer to God. 
Because when you're putting God into the equation, when you're asking God to go before you, when you go out onto the road as we drive down 100 miles this afternoon, before you get on the highway, say, God, put your angels around us. Protect us and keep us safe. And you are inviting God's presence to be with you at every opportunity. When you ask God to allow you to be a light when you go to work, when you ask God to go before you when you go into town, when you ask God to, to anoint your hands to do the work that you're doing, you're inviting God to be a part of your life. Right. And it brings into remembrance of the things that God has done for you in the past. And it, and it brings to, into reality who He is and what He can do in your life. And as we begin to walk away from God and as we begin to become more self-centered, that's when that murmuring and that complaining starts to come into our lives. The work is, is mundane and the people around us are this and they're that. And I don't know why I'm in the situation I'm in. It's been said that a person doesn't backslide overnight. Demas, I don't believe, went from being a fellow servant a fellow worker to forsaking them in a week or a month. It took time when he started to allow the things that he was doing for God to just, him, he started to allow self to creep in. I don't feel like going on that outreach trip. I don't feel like going where they're all going. I don't feel like doing what they're doing anymore. But he didn't want to appear to be backsliding, so he just followed along. No longer really working, but just tagging along. Until he finally had enough and walked away. See, the Bible only mentions Demas in those three verses that we've read. In those three different passages. And it makes us wonder, do, were those around him pushing him? Encouraging him? Trying to lift him up. Did they recognize Demas' state? Did they recognize where he was at? Did they recognize that he was slipping back to who he once was? And did they try to lift him up? Did they try to encourage him? Did they try to bring him along on the journey that they were following? Doing a work for God. Reaching their, their world at that time. Wanting to have him be a part of them. Or did he have, on, have a nice facade going on that they didn't realize his state until it was too late? The Bible doesn't tell us. All the Bible tells us is that he went from being a fellow worker to one that forsook them and walked away. See, it's important for us to have that desire to work closer to God, to every day ask God to be with you in all that you're doing. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. We might go to our jobs today for the paycheck. But know that the attitude that you take to your job, the spirit in which you put into your job, the effort that you push every day to do a little bit better. You may not get a raise down here. You may not get a promotion down here. But God sees you doing it. And if you're doing it unto Him, you will get your reward. You will get it when you get to heaven. You will get it when you stand before him. Because it says, Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. And he's not talking about what you're doing. He's not talking about when you get up and you preach the word of, the God, word of God to the people. He's not talking about when you go out onto the city streets and you're reaching and witnessing to people, asking them to come to church, asking them to teach them a Bible study. He's not just talking about when you come into the church to help make peanut brittle. He's talking about that all that you do, that you do it unto God. That everywhere you go, you're going, believing that God is going with you. That you're going with a desire to please God in all that you do. Everything that we do every day, we should be saying, God, I want to please you. 
I want to do it heartily. I want to do it with everything that I have. And again, you're not every day isn't going to be. You're not every day living on the mountaintop. But in those bad days, when you've been doing it heartily unto God, then you can believe that God is there with you. Right. You can go to work and think, I don't really want to be here today. You can go to work and think, I'm, just, I'm struggling today to get through. But that's when your eyes are going to look up. And you're going to say, God, I need your help today. I need you to strengthen me today. To make it through. Because I want to tell you today that living for God doesn't just happen. It begins with a desire. A desire that says, I don't want to live the way I've been living. A desire that says, I want something better. And that desire leads you to a place where you're going to hear the Word of God. It's going to lead you to a place where your heart is going to allow that Word of God to begin to change you. It's going to lead you to a place where it's going to begin to impact your life. And then the Word of God is going to start doing things inside of you. And you're going to have that now that desire to start giving your life to Him. You're going to have now that through that desire you're going to hear the Word of God and the Word of God is going to impact you to a place that you realize that you are a sinner. And that you need God. Because the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that desire is going to lead you now. And that impact that it has on your life is going to lead you to an altar. Where you're going to get down on your knees and say, God, I'm sorry. And then your faith is going to believe that God forgives you. And in faith you go down in that watery grave of baptism to have that all washed away. And then it's your faith that allows God to move in your heart. To soften your heart enough that you can receive that Holy Ghost on the inside. Right. Evidenced by speaking in other tongues. But it doesn't end there. That desire only gets you so far. Now it becomes work. Now it becomes an effort that you have to put in to say, God, I want to live for you every day. God, I want to glorify you every day. And it doesn't just happen. Because that's what I think what happens so often is people come in and they go through that whole new birth part. They, get all, they do all the things they need to do and they think, okay, now I'm set. And they let it go. Because desire only carries you so far. Now you have to get up in the morning and say, God, I want to talk to you. God, I want to spend some time with you. Now I want to be able to glorify you in the things that I do. God, I want you to help me to be a witness to the people that I'm around every day. Realizing that we are compassed about with a cloud of witnesses. Realizing that when people hear of the changes in our lives and they begin to witness that change, they're going to look for us to fail. And we need to say, no, I'm not going to fail. No, I'm not going to get down. I'm going to give God glory every day I go to work. I'm going to give God glory every time I go out into the city. I'm going to give God glory everywhere I go, no matter what I do. It's going to be work. Like every other relationship in our lives, it takes work. The best thing that any one of us can do is look into the mirror. Because believe it or not, I can't change you. I can't change my wife. I can't change my children. There's only one person in this world that I can change. And that's the one that I look at every morning when I walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror. And I can look at that person and say, you, I can change. I can affect a difference in you. That's important for us to look in that mirror at times. And ask the hard questions. How are you doing today? We know what this, where this world is and we know about all the things that we hear in this world about mental health. And we're expected to be aware of all the people around us and, and be able to ask our friends and, the, and those that we're close to every day. We're supposed to ask those hard questions. How are you doing? When we see people down. When we see people not acting as they should be. When we see people 
reacting to things around them. And we're supposed to ask those questions to them. But how much more should we be asking ourselves those hard questions? Get up in the morning and look in that mirror and say, how are you doing today? Are you on fire for God today? Did you invite him to go with you before you start your day? Look in the mirror and ask those questions. But the reason we don't is because we just put on a smile. And we try to fool ourselves into thinking that we're all right. Look in that mirror and say, is your focus on the things of God and pleasing Him? Because when you're God-focused, you will constantly be working closer to Him. I want to reread back to Hebrews chapter 4, verses 1 through 13 that we started off with today. This passage talks about the rest, talks about the day of rest that, that God had when he built the world, and it talks about entering into that rest. Verse number one says, let us therefore fear lest the promise being left of us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place, again, if they shall enter into my rest... Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Again he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, Today, after so long a time, as it is said, Today if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that has entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, that any man fall after the same example of unbelief. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Let us labor, let us work, therefore, to enter into that rest. We have to labor for that rest. We have to work every day, striving to make it. And he said, those that don't make it, don't make it because of unbelief. We need to believe that when we get down on our knees and when we pray and we ask God to go with us, that he's going with us. We need to believe that when we pray and say, God, I need your strength, that he's going to strengthen us. God, we need to, we need to pray that, or believe when we pray that say, God, I need you to order my steps today because I can't do it on my own. That he's going to do exactly that. We labor to enter into that rest. As we stand together today, I say let us labor. Let us be driven by our faith in God that we may enter into his rest. Back to Colossians 3, verse 17, says, Whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We need to every day be working closer to God.
This isn't a normal message. I'm not even going to bother opening the altar today. But I urge that you would bow your heads, close your eyes. And say, God, whatever I do, I want to give you glory. Then when I go to work, the next time I go to work, let me do it unto you, God. Let me do it so it's pleasing to you, God. This morning's message was more to help you on your walk. Because that time is going to come for our rest. We need to labor that we enter in. Lord, I'm thankful, Jesus, for your hand upon us today, for your blessings and for your mercy, for those that are assembled together.